think about that and you go all the way back to the beginning of the film, you're like, well, no wonder why she can't write anything. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. This is exciting. So I have on with me a special guest, screenwriter, author, and staff at Ink Tip, Chris Cookson. Chris, thanks for being on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, I watched this movie Blank, and from what I understand, its origins were on Ink Tip. It got found on Ink Tip, optioned and produced. Is that right? That is correct. I actually did some digging this morning into when and how it was found. And it's kind of wild. Um, uh, producer director, Natalie Kennedy, mm -hmm. found it actually on our site the first day she searched on Inktip. That's awesome. Which is crazy. Yes. Um, so the writer, Stephen Herman, and I noticed that she assigned a read to one of her readers the first day she logged into Inktip for blank and the rest is history. Now we're talking about it. <laughs> That's awesome. No, I, I enjoyed this movie. So I thought, you know what, let's do a film analysis. So we're going to talk about this film. Okay. I'm going to hit you with this log line just so that the uh, listeners know kind of what's going on with this film. A desperate writer signs up for a fully AI operated retreat to cure her writer's block. But when an unforeseen software glitch occurs, she gets trapped inside her unit with an unstable Android and no communication with the outside world. So this is blank. I saw it on Amazon Prime. I'm sure it's probably at other streaming video on demand places as well. Um, did you catch it on Prime too? I believe I did. Okay. This this was a fun script, and I'm going to tell you why, or a fun film, because I'm watching it, prepping to do film analysis. My kid's 16 years old, and he keeps walking past me. I'm like, you're right, dude. He's like, <laughs> what, are you, what are you watching? I'm like, I'm doing a film analysis on this movie. He's like, well, well can I join? And I'm like, well, if anybody has a 16-year-old, you know, that's like the holy grail when your kid wants to hang out with you. So I was like, absolutely. So he sat down with me and watched it and was engaged the whole time. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So what I really like about this film, well, one, I mean, we're writers, right? When have you not had writer's block? Um, it always happens. Yeah. You so, just have to push through it. <laughs> right. So we're already we're already empathetic towards this character because she has writer's block. She's a she's a successful author. Uh, total spoilers on this. If you haven't watched the movie yet, go watch the movie, come back, listen to the film analysis. But um, or a lot of people just listen to the film film analysis and then watch the movie spoiled. But I can't, you know, everybody has their process. So with this, she's she's in the she goes to this retreat which reminds me of i don't know if you're familiar with this but there were um hotels in france that you could go and you can rent a room for a month in a hotel in france just as writer's retreat for yourself i had not heard of that but yeah. i think i need to do something like yeah. that but maybe more of a country house in provence or something right and <laughs> and so what they'll provide everything for you you'll get three meals a day they'll bring it to your room they'll do all this stuff for you and you just sit there and you write that's it every all the other pressure is off of you so i really like that concept of taking that that idea which is real and spinning it into this ai powered retreat in this beautiful home um, and then, uh, you know, things go down and she's trapped in there. Now, what I really think is cool that is different from every other kind of rogue AI film out there is that the Rita, the, uh, the AI, she resets every day. She resets and it's what I appreciated with the film is when you read that log line, you think you know where this is going. Yeah. You've, you've seen, you're like, oh, I've seen this before. Yep. A AI going berserk, you know. Right. You don't actually know where it's going, which I really appreciated. That's a really good point. I mean, you think this is, 
man or woman versus machine. And, and it's so not, it's, it's misleading, but on purpose, because this is really, this is a thriller, what we're looking mm-hmm. at, right? We're trying, we're trying to solve the mystery of not even what's going on in the outside world, because that's typically where you'd go with this. You're going, you're being, there's a, a subplot that's introduced about her past and it's, it's threaded throughout the entire script and there's intrigue there. So really you're sticking around to find out what the hell is going on with this lady mm-hmm. and everything else, the uh, po- potential apocalypse going on outside. That's just kind of flavor. I mean, it's just, it's world building. It's there, but we're not focusing on it. We're focusing on her. This is, this is a character study. And I thought it was cool. So with the subplot, what were your thoughts on that? One, uh, they shot it differently, which I thought was great. So it looked very old worldy, you yes, know, it, it had this kind of ambient, like yellowish amber skew going on. Um, and then the creepy mom. Oh, she was brilliant. And that's actually one of the, rep- uh, one of the producers, Rebecca Claire Evans playing the mom. Really? And she was great. I've never seen a blind person portrayed that way before. I have to tell you that much. It was <laughs> it was disturbing because she's blind. So everything the character does does is tactile, which which is a great way to introduce an antagonist because now we have an excuse for the antagonist to always be in her face, always be touching her always be right there, always have this threatening glare, even though she can't see her. And I thought subtextually that's brilliant and terrifying. Yes. That's a, that's a wonderful point that you bring up that I hadn't even really put together, but the moment you said it, I just thought, yes, absolutely. Because even the camera angles and everything are so close and you just feel almost suffocated in this house that really you you never see a full room in that house it's it's you're just seeing like this corner this window um lots of uh shots through mirrors things like that i know it's 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 demented in the way it it promotes the claustrophobic aspect of it but that builds that thriller aspect really i mean because this is a um this is a small script uh, it's easily can be done as a single location. There are a couple of locations, but they're both closed. They're homes. I mean, we're not mm-hmm. we're not going crazy here. Um, so this this can be done uh, purposely. You can tell they they did it really contained, keeping the budget down, things like that, um, which is a really difficult way of writing. I mean, anybody can write about, you know, a car that goes into outer space and makes it to the moon, you know, whatever. But when you're trying to write something engaging with a small cast, um, it gets really hard because now you have to really drive the, the character up. So I really love that subplot because the intrigue there and the ambiguity of what mm-hmm. their intentions are kept me going. I'm like, okay, what is happening? Is is this daughter who's writing the stories for her blind mother, who's obviously abusive, is she poisoning her mother? No, she's not poisoning her mother. Oh, it's it's medication and the mom doesn't want the meds. Is it because the mom's crazy? You know, so like you there's this ambiguity here, which is brilliant as far as the script goes, because it keeps your mind engaged in what is going on. Um, and I love that because our brains are problem solvers. So whenever you can introduce some kind of an ambiguity or, or something that intrigues the reader or the viewer, they're going to want to keep continuing the, the, to watch and see what's going on. Exactly. And the fact that it, it links back to the main story of the near future trapped in the retreat plot is nice. It's not just its own. There's more to it than just, oh, this is the story she's writing. Right. Well, you just said, I mean, the theme, I always look for a theme, Chris, the theme for this one is not man versus machine, woman versus machine. The theme is entrapment. It is. And it is not just entrapment of, yes, she is trapped in a, in a, in a, um, 
in a in a retreat. And then we go to the subplot because subplots always reflect the theme in one way or another, where there's an antithesis or it is thematic and the subplot there is she's trapped with her blind mm -hmm. mother, right? Literally, mom wears keys around her neck so that her mm -hmm. daughter can't get out of the house, right? So, um, so she's physically trapped, but she's not just trapped physically. How many scenes do we see of her running? outside in the first act before she is finally trapped in the house we see several scenes of her running at first thought you think are they just chewing up time no running is a great way to show a character's inner dramatic struggle it's an awesome tool i've done it and you can use it in different ways so what is she running she is running from the book yeah she's running from her responsibilities yeah, absolutely. And as a writer myself, it's interesting too, because I use running as a device to write my books. Oh, that's great. So I'll make a playlist that I think fits what I'm trying to write, go for a run. And while that's how I, that's how I'm able to run. Cause if I think about running, I can't run. I get so messed up in my head. <laughs> I'm just like, Oh, I can't do this. I'm so exhausted. But I start thinking about scenes for my book. That's awesome. And then all of a sudden they start playing my head and I've got it and I can come back from my run and start writing. So that's where originally I thought, I was like, oh yeah, she's running because she needs to think about her book, but right. no, she's running to avoid. Yeah. And, and let's face it, she's, she's running because she's running. She's been running her whole life, essentially. Exactly. She's been running her whole life. And so we're seeing it. And at first glance, you think, oh, she's just, she's athletic, right? And, mm -hmm. and then, you know, as the story progresses, you start to realize more and more like, oh, she is, she is, uh, she's definitely running. And so now she's trapped in the building. She can't get out. Uh, and there, and, and they, and there's great things the script does. Like it, it increases stakes. Like she's running out of food. Yes. <laughs> you know, running out of wine, which seems yeah, running out of wine, which is a big deal. Um, the robot is breaking down. The android at one point is like trying to wash dishes and instead she's breaking them in half, like kind of crazy stuff. Well, I think that also links into it's not just the human characters who are trapped. The AI Rita, she's essentially trapped in her own loop cycle. Oh, I love that observation. And can't get out of it. And then the Wayne Brady character, Henry, who's his own AI. Yeah. Like he gets trapped in this whole like virus has attacked him and he can't yeah. do anything. Yeah, exactly. He's he's there. He's there for exposition. He's there lot. for exposition, a lot of hand holding. And yes. but really also as as her character begins to come into her own power after this scene. The basically the midpoint will be called death and return, where where her character tries to set the house on fire and it does not work, um, <laughs> and dies, uh, and and she comes back, which is visually represented with burn marks on her chest from the paddles because the AI keeps yep. bringing her back. <laughs> so, um, at, after she starts coming into her own power and and that onion starts unraveling, we don't need that character anymore. So it makes sense to start to get rid of him so that she can't have her hand held anymore. Um, exactly. I I love the big twist towards the end. So you got to have a good twist, Chris. You got to have a good twist. And the and the and as, as we get more and more revelations of this subplot with her and her mother and and there's glimpses of her escaping with the keys right so we okay she gets out and the mom is reaching out not and said that she's gone and then the big reveal is uh is that when they when she was abusing her daughter her daughter fought back and the mom fell down the stairs and died that's the big reveal and i was like yeah that's that's a good twist and the interjecting of her fighting with her mother and Rita playing the character of her mother from mm. reading the book was delicious. <laughs> yes, that uh, the Rita character, I, I, I found that interesting that she's so composed until she reads the book and then she just embodies this 
the horrible antagonist that yeah. Claire has been trying to get away from her whole life. I know. I thought it was great. I mean, it, you want to have personal growth forced upon you, get a rogue AI. <laughs> Well, I also found the twist with the writing interesting, and I think they leave it up to interpretation. And the way I interpret it, in the end, when the daughter is packing up all those manuscripts, and then you pan to see the books that Claire has published, that you realize she's essentially stolen her mom's work. And and they talk about plagiarism. Remember in the very early part oh, when, when she says- right. You can't, you can't leave until you finish the book, right? She grabs a book off the shelf and then just types it out page by yep. page, hands it in. And then um, the Android says, this is plagiarism and then goes through all of the things that plagiarism can result in. It's criminal and, and things like that. I think if she even says death, which I don't know, but, um, and so then it is like, yeah, she plagiarized her mom. She never actually she never actually sent her mom's stuff in. She lied to her mom about being accepted to the um, mm -hmm. to the magazine and then stole her work. And so then when you think about that and you go all the way back to the beginning of the film, you're like, well, no wonder why she can't write anything. <laughs> you know, she's stolen everything. Yeah. If that, but in my mind's eye, I want to say that they left it open to interpretation as well, because I want to believe, and maybe this is be trying to see the good in people. Maybe she's just a terrible person, but I want to believe that she was writing her own stories and not what her mother was saying to her. And so they were all, all her own scripts, but yeah, it, it is very, it is very possible that she plagiarized it, especially when she, she finishes her story and there's a little after credits teaser where she gets into her car mm -hmm. and lays the script down and the title is Confessions. Uh, Wayne Brady, they got Wayne Brady on this playing the AI. How crazy is that? I know, I know. I was talking about that with my husband. Just like, how how do you get Wayne Brady? <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. yeah. It was probably a quick shoot with him, but um, oh, it was yes. it, it was cool that that they were able to get him and I enjoyed it. I mean, the, the main actor... Um, she was she was in um, Once Upon a Time, the TV show. I saw that. Um, yeah, Rachel so Shelley. Yeah. yeah, so I thought that was really cool. She's she's pretty great. Um, and the and the actor who played Rita was just she's she nailed that otherworldly presence. Yep, she was so good as an AI. Just just yeah. the little her head movements and the way she kind of spoke and yeah. everything just it was great and I loved the choice of doing a near future sci-fi and setting the AI dressing her as a 50s housewife yeah um there's something I really like about the blending of periods there was another it's creepy tv show it was the recent Sabrina the the teenaged witch okay um version and it was set contemporary i'm pretty sure because yeah. they were using cell phones but the whole production design was very 1950s oh, which i loved because i mean that that's a nod to the comic book so right. i do like that blending of time periods especially in something either sci-fi or fantasy and they do little things with her um they would have her eyes kind of blink Mm -hmm. But when they would blink, they would blink more to the side, which is more animal like and mm. and pre and presents that as a like this is not human. This is and it, right. it and it provides that again, that that creepiness factor to it. Um, I really didn't enjoy this. Uh, so in uh, the fact that this got optioned off of ink tip is so cool. I mean, you guys provide really great opportunity for writers out there. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. We do, we do try. <laughs> We've been, it's been 20 years. So wow, that's yeah. crazy. I did not know you guys have been going that long. Yep. Very good. Well, We're actually, I guess we're in 2022. So I guess it's been 22 years, really. Oh, so you guys have been around for as long as I've been married. That's crazy. Oh my goodness. Well, congratulations. Oh, that's a yeah. long time. <laughs> I know. It's pretty great. All right. So um, I really enjoyed this and I would like to do this again with you, Chris, if you're up to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So it's blank on Amazon Prime. 
uh, optioned off of Ink Tip, super cool, directed by Natalie Kennedy, written by Stephen Herman. Uh, it looks like he worked on the black box, which is pretty cool. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I did want to mention, which I thought was so interesting about this production, um, uh, Natalie and Rebecca are out of the UK. Stephen is based out of New York. Oh, wow. So it really does show how small our world is getting, especially when it comes to Hollywood. There isn't that need for, you know, producers and directors or, and screenwriters to have to be in Los Angeles anymore. Like they can connect across the world and still make great films. I totally agree with you. I, I love the fact that you can find services like Ink Tip to get out there and get your stuff on there, um, and not and not feel like you know you have to go live in a van in LA because <laughs> that's all we can or, afford to get man. <laughs> or get like sixteen roommates, you know. So I think that, uh, yeah, I'm, it is good. It, the, the world is being more connected and smaller each day. So that's pretty awesome.